Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. And welcome to the Sheldonian Theatre, where we have gathered under the stunning 17th century ceiling, depicting truth descending on the arts and sciences, to remember and to celebrate the life of an exceptional and multifaceted man, a friend and colleague to many here, and an iconic figure to many who are not. Sir Roger Bannister. Both the City and the University of Oxford have a very large number of seriously impressive people associated with them, scholars, leaders, athletes, and more. But very few of them have been all three to such a high level as Sir Roger. This highly unusual occasion where the City, University, and County come together to celebrate one man's life reflects the remarkable range of his talents and accomplishments. We will hear today from many of the people closest to Sir Roger and experts in fields in which he excelled. Professor Sir Rick Trainer, Rector of Exeter College, will speak about Sir Roger's early years and his time as an undergraduate at Exeter. Mr. Steve Cram, Chancellor of the University of Sunderland and himself an Olympic medalist, will speak about Sir Roger the athlete. Professor David Thomas, Emeritus Professor of Clinical Neuroscience, will speak of Sir Roger the Medic. Dame Lynn Brindley, Master of Pembroke College, will speak of his years as Master of Pembroke. Mr. Tim Stevenson, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant of Oxfordshire, will speak of his contributions to the region and the country. The Chancellor, Lord Patton of Barnes, will speak as only he can. And finally, we will hear from Lady Maura Bannister. Later, at the Town Hall, we will hear from the Lord Mayor and Mr. Clive Bannister. I'm sure that everyone here today, like people up and down the country, carries an image in their mind of the epic scene of Sir Roger breaking the four-minute mile. I'm sure everyone here today also carries memories of less public moments with Sir Roger. Before we met the, man the Bannisters in Oxford, my husband Tom told me of being grilled by the legendary doctor who had broken the four-minute mile on his very first day as a young visiting medical student at Queen Square Hospital for Neurology. A few days after we arrived in, in Oxford, Sir Roger and Lady Moira kindly invited us around for tea and a chat. He neglected to mention that he had also invited a large number of distinguished Oxford figures with the offer of tea and an invitation to grill the unsuspecting newly arrived vice chancellor. <laughs> I had the distinct sense that he wanted to satisfy himself that the appointments panel had not made a mistake. He cared deeply for the university and his commitment was in evidence right to the end as he came out to events to support young students and athletes who were always thrilled to see him. With the depth and the range and the longevity of the roles and relationships, Sir Roger Bannister was truly an Oxford man in every sense of that term. As they say where I come from, Niveg Alahed Rishan, we will not see his like again, or indeed, if we do, we will be very lucky. Thank you so much, Vice Chancellor, for your kind words. On behalf of all the Bannister family, I'm delighted to welcome you here to the Sheldonian. Others today will speak of my father's commitment to sport, medicine, and academia. But I wish to convey something of his family life. One of the greatest gifts that my father instilled in us, his children, Erin, Clive, Thurston, and me, was a love of the outdoors, on weekends in Sussex, he would take us on long walks in the South Downs, runs along the beach, or sailing in the English Channel. Further afield, we would go hiking in Snowdonia and the Lake District, where as a child, it seemed to me that no hill was too far away to climb, nor no lake too broad to navigate. This seizing of every moment his passion of always challenging us, as he did himself, reminds me of the lines of Kipling. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth 
and everything that's in it. Another gift my father gave us was the gift of drawing people together for friendship and hospitality. Both my parents loved entertaining, and even as young children, we would attend their parties, shake guests' hands, share in the pleasure of earnest conversation and robust discussion. My father's deep fascination with new friends and welcoming others into our home lasted throughout his life. And just as my father poured energy into and supported us, his children, he also took great interest in each one of his 14 grandchildren. My parents were constantly giving them tea, reading to them, went to all their plays, their concerts, their matches, and followed all their academic and sporting pursuits. But finally, what I want to share with you is my father's interest in theology and philosophy. As a young boy, his parents took him and his sister to the Unitarian services, and later in his 30s, he was actually baptized and confirmed into the Church of England at All Souls Langham Place. In Oxford, he loved the chapel in Pembroke and later became an enthusiastic member of the university church. I truly believe that my father understood what a single act of kindness could do to justify a life and help the world. One of his very favorite quotes was from Samuel Johnson's essay, What Have Ye Done? He that has improved the virtue or advanced the happiness of one fellow creature, he that has ascertained a single moral proposition, or added one useful experiment to natural knowledge, may be contented with his own performance, and with respect to mortals like himself, may demand, like Augustus, to be dismissed at his departure with applause. Thank you for sharing this celebration with us of his life and for remembering a unique and loving husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather.
Good afternoon. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to speak about Sir Roger Bannister's early years, including his time as an Oxford undergraduate. Sir Roger and Lady Moira warmly welcomed me and my wife Marguerite in 2014 when I took up the rectorship, that is the headship, of Exeter College. Exeter was Roger's undergraduate college and a place to which he frequently returned throughout his adult life. As a result, I learned much about Roger's early years, as well as about trying to master the subtle art of running an Oxford college. But as a historian, I must also acknowledge my other sources, especially Roger's autobiography, Twin Tracks, and material from his children, who have strong Exeter connections of their own. Born in Harrow in 1929, Roger Bannister had a truly happy childhood. During it, he developed qualities that sustained him throughout life. A strong yet modest belief in himself, a deep-seated intellectual curiosity, a taste for taking initiatives despite the risks, and an abiding sense of gratitude and loyalty. Roger's parents, Alice and Ralph, proud natives of Lancashire, had migrated to London in search of economic advantage. Ralph had won his way into the clerical grade of the civil service through spectacular examination success. For Alice and Ralph, parental achievements were secondary to their hopes for Roger and his sister Joyce. Roger, a classic meritocrat, earned one of the few places from his state primary school to the selective Harrow Boys County School. Evacuated to Bath during the early years of the Second World War, Roger kept thriving academically. But he excelled even more after the family's return to London allowed Roger to attend University College School on the direct grant place that his successes in Bath had earned. His appetite for learning and achievement was keen. He immersed himself in science textbooks to compensate for the absence on war service of science teachers from the school. This steady academic progress did not, however, make Roger a SWAT. He developed a strong taste for sport, especially athletics, winning his first race at the age of 11. He thought nothing of cycling from Bath to London and back for sheer enjoyment. Moreover, he remained close to his family, from which he derived strong ethical influences. As Roger later commented, I was trained to respect authority, keep in line, work hard, and do well. So he applied early at the age of 16 for Oxbridge admission. His intended Cambridge College thought he should wait a year, but Exeter College gave him an immediate place. As Roger saw it, if London had been my father's escape from Lancashire, Oxford became my hoped for escape from suburbia. Oxford became my great goal, coupled with dreams of athletic success. He envisaged the freedom Oxford would grant me of social, sporting, and academic opportunities I yearned to embrace. Roger's four years as an undergraduate reading physiological sciences accelerated his personal, academic, and athletic development. He delighted in the raucous egalitarian atmosphere in which young men and returning war veterans mixed in Exeter's junior common room. There he found both relaxation and intellectual stimulation. Then, as later, a person whom others instinctively trusted, he was elected JCR president and helped stage an Elizabethan ball. Academically, Roger excelled in the preclinical program quickly moving beyond the ingestion of facts to a strong taste for discovery in physiology. Roger also devoted substantial time to athletics. Underestimated at first by his running peers in Oxford, Roger established his prowess in a come-from-behind victory in the Oxford-Cambridge mile race in March 1947. As he reflected later, I suddenly tapped that hidden source of energy I always suspected I possessed. 
Roger was elected president of the Oxford University Athletic Club and later of Vincent's. Characteristically, he was the driving force in a successful, though traumatic, campaign for a new Ifley Road track. Seldom has an athlete done more to shape his own destiny. <laughs> Thus, Roger Bannister was on a decidedly upward trajectory when, in 1950, he finished his undergraduate degree and secured a senior scholarship at Merton, where he completed a Master of Science degree a year later for work in respiratory physiology. The person whose life we are celebrating today was still very young as he left Oxford in 1951 for clinical academic training at St. Mary's Hospital in London. But Roger was full of promise as a doctor, a researcher, an athlete, and a leader. He was well and truly launched, then as now, what Oxford wants for its new alumni. Thank you very much. Up to the finishing line, time three minutes, 59.4 seconds, shattering the four minute mile, the Everest of athletic achievement. Well done, Roger Bannister. The four minute mile is Britain's. Throughout the winter, I've been watching the newspapers, seeing whether Landy would do it first or whether Santee would do it first in America. And I, I'm very glad that, that it has come from England in the end. Good afternoon, lords, ladies, gentlemen, fellow athletes, <laughs> of which I know we are all. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to spend a few minutes with you this afternoon, not to go over Roger's athletics career, because it was actually quite a short one, as we've just seen. Um, but it was one which had an impact, which I'm not sure he or anybody really could have understood at the time. I suppose it's rare for any of us in life in four minutes, or indeed 359.4, uh, to make such an impact. And it's rarer still in life or in sport that such a performance takes on a, a resonance that probably none of us realized at the time. It was of its time. 1954 was a time when communication was just beginning to be something which allowed occasions like this to be shared around the world. If you like, it went viral, to use a modern parlance. But Sir Roger's amazing achievement at the uh, track at Oxford in, in 1954 still today resonates, 64 years later. And it wasn't just the breaking of a, of a record which, as we said in there, seemed impossible, a time barrier that many had achieved to break, but it represented much more than that. It captured the pioneering spirit of the times. And as I said, it was magnified in a way which, which was really unusual, but it's meant that today, millions of people can still enjoy that footage in a way which perhaps if it had happened a few years earlier, it might not have been the case. It also represented a time, I think, where it was almost a tipping point, if you like, from the time of, of the Corinthian values in sport uh, being kind of gradually replaced by a much more professional approach. And I don't mean that in terms of just a commercial point of view, just the way in which people approached sport. And I guess as a young boy, uh, as a young athlete myself, uh, coming into the sport of athletics, none of that really uh, resonated with me. I did, though, know Sir Roger Bannister, not Sir at that point. I knew three people in sport. Jeff Hurst, I'm that old, um, Muhammad Ali and Roger Bannister. And when I came into um, athletics at the uh, age of 11, my coach immediately, the first thing he did was say to me, 
you've got to learn about the history of your sport. And he made me go and read the book Four Minute Mile. I'd never met um, Roger Bannister, although I'd heard of him. And that really was the first time that a spark was ignited in, in, inside me, which gave me an, an image of something that perhaps could be possible. And of course, that has happened over the decades to men and women all around the world. You saw at the beginning that slide, I'm one of 13 lucky people to have followed him. Only 13 people to have broken the world mile record uh, since that day. It's an exclusive and a, and a privileged club. And he's at the head of it. And as if to underline that position, recently, and, and if you have any doubt about the impact of what Roger's done around the world, um, I was at an event at the end of the athletic season and you'll see him up here shortly. Um, I bumped into the guy who's the current world record holder, a guy called Hisham El Garouge from Morocco. And I was chatting to Hisham and I was telling him, um, and I was actually going to another event to celebrate Sir Roger's life the next day. And he had his 11 year old daughter with him. And he kind of said to his daughter, this is Steve, a guy I used to run against. But when I talked about Roger and I mentioned where I was going, he stopped me to explain to his 11 year old daughter who Sir Roger Bannister was. And he described him to her. I asked her to ask what he'd actually said to her. And he described to his 11-year-old daughter that Roger Bannister is our spiritual father. And I just thought it was such a, a lovely thing that you perhaps don't see or hear in, in sport these days. It's, it is about passing tradition down, but it's about understanding what he meant and what he achieved. And even for somebody who perhaps not necessarily knowing and understanding uh, the impact that he'd had at the time. Even his 11-year-old you know, daughter is being drawn into the history of that achievement. And you have probably see Hisham's picture up there. He, he was, all of us held him in such high esteem. It's still hard to run a four-minute mile. It's still difficult. So Roger is still ranked number 918 in the world at the mile <laughs> all these years later. And at a time when they didn't have synthetic tracks, as we've already been mentioned, we didn't have sports science and sports medicine and the training methods, perhaps. They trained hard. You heard his own quotes. He worked hard, not frightened to do that. But the way in which people, athletes are allowed to train today and still find it difficult to break a four-minute mile should make everybody sit up and realize that he genuinely really was a talented man. And that's something which we should never forget. You could perhaps argue that away from the four minute mile, the pictures we've seen there of that brilliant race against John Landy was perhaps his real achievement in terms of an, a pure athletics performance. A race which was later termed the miracle mile in which he ran his personal best. People forget this. They'll say, what did Roger Bannister run? 359.4, we know that. No, he ran 358.8. That's what ranks him 918. Otherwise he'd be ranked 1,259th. <laughs> These things matter in athletics. <laughs> so he's somebody for whom I'm not sure we really found out how good he could have been because obviously he chose, as we've heard, to pursue his other career, his other passion, medicine. And although he left competitive athletics, he was never too far away and people like myself were able to benefit from that. He was always interested, always passionate. Sometimes challenging. He was never afraid to voice an opinion. He was never afraid to have a conversation with you that asked difficult questions, uh, which I really, really enjoyed. I had far too many, far too few occasions to enjoy longer conversations with him. He genuinely first contacted me when I ran my first sub four minute mile at age 17, a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> We met on several occasions, as I've said, and he was always so engaged, and then conversations would cover many, many topics. He was always really interested in the development of East African athletes. Altitude training was a, a, passionate, a passion of his. Drugs in sport, inevitably, we got round to. And on occasion, he would even chastise me a little bit about our coverage on the BBC, which he also took an interest in as well. And I, I was never quite sure about how, how all of this sat with him. His, his athletics career was, was short, and although it shone brightly, it was something which um, I suppose he, he, other people might have allowed it to completely eclipse the rest of their lives, but of course he never did that. He went on to be an incredibly successful person away from, from that world. And I always try to work out kind of how you know, people like him managed to strike that balance. And I, I, I sort of, to put it into my own terms, he was somebody who 
you know, he didn't dine out on being the first man to break the four minute mile, but it was, it was a kind of a nice little treat he used to like to return to now and then. He was always happy to be recognized for that, and so he should be. But he should also be recognized for some of the other things he did in sport. At the Sports Council, incredibly influential figure, he campaigned vigorously against the growing scourge of drugs in sport at a time when most people were ignoring its presence. He helped introduce the first test for anabolic steroids and indeed for the introduction, he campaigned for the introduction of random drug testing. All achievements I know he was immensely and rightly proud of. But it was that remarkable day here in Oxford which was his overriding legacy. There have been other singularly stunning performances in sport. You've probably got your favorites. Gary Sober's Six Sixes, Bob Beeman's Long Jump in Mexico, Maradona's Hand of God, good or bad. <laughs> but none have resonated, I don't think, as much with the general public. None have broken out of the world of sport into the general consciousness of people, not only here in the UK, but around the world. It wasn't just sport. It was a landmark that seemed that the whole of mankind was tuned into. And like climbing Everest or landing on the moon, it was something which will always be remembered. He became, I guess, the easiest answer in sports quizzes everywhere. <laughs> People still get asked the same question. The first man to break the four-minute mile, and I'll challenge you to find anybody of a certain age who wouldn't know the answer to that. Roger himself once said that the most important organ to a human being is not the heart or lungs, but the brain. A quote which could well be connected to his life studying neurology, but I like to think also he was referring to sport. He understood and epitomized all that we recognize in great champions. Human endeavor driven by fierce desire to find your own limits, to break barriers and to go beyond what others might expect you to do. But to do it in a manner which is respectful of others and humble in success. The world of sport needs its heroes, and he will forever be one of its greats.
My lords, ladies, gentlemen, Moira, I've been given strict instructions that I must run through Roger's medical career in under four minutes. <laughs> it's important to emphasize at the start that for most of his career, he did not work as an academic. He didn't have time for research, reflection, writing. No, he worked as a full-time NHS consultant, working long hours in demanding circumstances. I find it amazing that with that, he managed to achieve so much. Well, how did he do it? Well, he was certainly talented, he was highly motivated, he was focused, he worked hard, and he was well-trained. After Oxford, you heard that he sensibly came to St. Mary's in Paddington, and he thrived there, and after running the four-minute mile in 1954, he probably became the most famous medical student ever. <laughs> he landed superb hospital jobs before he was called up for his national service. In the army, he didn't waste time either. He passed the membership of the Royal College of Physicians exam, which was the road to uh, becoming a consultant, and then the army posted him to the Yemen, which was a war zone even then, and while at the Yemen, uh, he looked into the problems of hyperpyrexia because we were losing some of the squaddies dying in the heat. And he continued this research when he came back to London at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And this uh, involved injecting uh, volunteers and himself with a pyrogen that raised the body temperature and then they'd exercise in a heated chamber. Uh, well, no one volunteered more than once uh, for this. <laughs> so Roger had to um, do it several times, and Moira describes how ill he was uh, when he came home from one of these sessions. And I'm sure that this trauma to his nervous system played some role in the neurological problems that he developed in recent years. At the age of 34, he was appointed as a consultant neurologist to his own teaching hospital to St. Mary's and also as a consultant physician to the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases in Queen Square. He was accepted immediately at St. Mary's. One of us, you know, we know all about this chap. But at the National, some of the senior neurologists said, we wanted a world-class neurologist. We didn't want a famous athlete. Well, he sh soon showed them that he was both. They put him in charge of the intensive care unit, and this was very appropriate with his interest in physiology and in the control of breathing. And he set up the first autonomic function lab and attracted patients from all over the country. For those of you not in the field, the autonomic nervous system is sort of our civil service, you know, that behind the scenes and keeps things going, like keeping your blood pressure up and things like that. So he made a real study of the um, autonomic nervous system. He went on to publish 80 papers um, on problems with the autonomic nervous system. Uh, he became chairman of the Clinical Autonomic Research Society. He edited their journal, and he wrote the first major textbook on the subject. And I think he was instrumental in spreading the gospel about the need to treat autonomic problems seriously and with scientific background throughout the world. He also kept an interest in general neurology, and he took through six editions Brain and Bannister's Clinical Neurology, which was our standard textbook for trainees. It was uh, translated into several languages and used throughout the world. He had this long-standing interest in physiology, 
and as you might imagine, he was also very interested in sports medicine, and he played a big role in the British Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine, and he was instrumental in setting up the faculty. And now, with a faculty, sports medicine is a proper career. As you heard earlier, Roger received a lot of honours, but by far the greatest medical honour, indicating his true international status, was when the American Academy of Neurology in 2005 appointed him as their first recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award. That was no mean achievement. Roger felt strongly about encouraging young doctors to become involved in research, and the best way of doing this is via a clinical research training fellowship. And now, in recognition of Roger's tremendous contributions, his neurological colleagues have decided to name a fellowship after him. This is the first time that they've honoured one of our number in this way. All I and we have got to do now is to uh, raise the funds to do it. And you may find one of these slips uh, thrust in your hand later on today. One's lucky in life if one meets someone who truly inspires. Roger was an outstanding role model, and on behalf of his devoted colleagues, his students, and his many grateful patients, I'd like to say thank you, Roger. It was a very sad day for us when he left St. Mary's and went to Pembroke College, Oxford. <laughs> So Sir Roger was elected to the Mastership of Pembroke College in 1985, and he served in that capacity for eight years. He writes eloquently and amusingly in his autobiography about the mysterious process of the election of masters, reflecting that fellows are looking for the Archangel Gabriel. <laughs> but as reality prevails, they may find their breadth of choice narrows. He concludes that the role is no longer a sinecure, it might have been half a century ago, but involves hard work, continuous fundraising, and many and varied responsibilities. He also remarked that each day was highly unpredictable. Each morning, he knew there were going to be surprises, but he had little idea of the direction from which they might come how true that is today as well. Roger and Maura settled happily into the master's lodgings, originally Cardinal Wolsey's almshouse, which they made a perfect home. Decorated with Lady Maura's own paintings for visits from their children and grandchildren and a place for formal and informal entertaining. The image of Samuel Johnson looking down from his portrait onto a magnificent rocking horse for the three grandchildren has to bring a smile to one. Roger got to work, though, on ambitious plans for the new building, which later was named the Geoffrey Arthur Building, or the Gab. The college bought a part of the old town gasworks site south of the river for a building to house 100 students. This expansion would enable Pembroke to house all its undergraduates in residence, important given the dire shortage of accommodation in the city at that time. At the same time, Sir Roger cultivated Pembroke's American alum, setting up a North American Alumnus Association with its own charitable foundation, chaired by Senator Richard Luger. With both Senator Luger and Senator Fulbright being alumni, Pembroke's profile in the USA was high. There was great enthusiasm for the new build project and donations were generous. Also reflecting an appreciation of James Smithson, another Pembrokean, whose fortune enabled the founding of the Smithsonian Institution. When the Gab was opened by Senator Fulbright in 1990, planning had already started with a view to acquiring a neighboring site 
and where numbers 7 and 8 Brewer Street would provide 12 more student rooms. This became the Sir Roger Bannister Building and was uh, enveloped in a major project two de decades later that provided a whole new quad for Pembroke. Buildings and fundraising for them did not get in the way of Sir Roger's interest in each and every undergraduate. All students had opportunities to come to the lodgings with a final term party for third and fourth years before they became submerged in work for finals. His mastership saw Pembroke's highest ever number of firsts with stellar prizes in Arabic, in law and in medicine. But it wasn't all about academic achievement, as Roger, with the help of Mora, set the tone of a friendly and encouraging environment, and naturally, he expressed enthusiasm for sport. The college gradually moved up to triumphs on the river. Men went head of the river in 1995, and in 2003, the double headship was achieved. It was in Sir Roger's time that the annual garden party, followed by everyone going to cheer on the Pembroke crews on, in summer eights, was firmly established in the Pembroke social calendar. On his retirement, there were many wonderful messages of goodwill and affection from old members. Sir Roger's engagement, though, continued unabated with Pembroke, and there were always young people wanting to speak with him. His legacy lives on in college, and the Bannister Award for Outstanding Performance in Academic and Sporting Achievement is made annually. Additionally, the Bannister Medical Scholarship is awarded for the most distinguished performance in FHS examinations. Sir Roger's athletics trophies remain on display in Pembroke, honoring his memory and inspiring students and visitors alike to achieve great things. Thank you. A man for all seasons. That's the description in 1520 by one Robert Whittington of Sir Thomas More. He went on to describe his man for all seasons as a man of wit and learning, a man of gentleness, lowliness, and affability, of marvelous mirth and pastimes, and sometime of as sad gravity, talented in many areas, ready to take on anything and to cope with any contingency. He might, you'll think, have been writing about Roger. As the Queen's representative in Oxfordshire, I have the honour today of speaking briefly about his contribution, both countrywide and particularly in Oxfordshire. Some 18 months ago, I was walking north down St John's Street in Oxford toward Wellington Square. In the other direction, I suddenly saw the wonderful sight of Roger on his rocket-powered scooter bike, with which he was particularly thrilled, although I'm not sure that Moira was quite as excited. He was wrapped up in overcoat and helmet. There was a focused and determined expression on his face as he hurtled at considerable speed towards the junction with Beaumont Street, on his way, no doubt, to a lunch or a speech or a presentation. In a rather more prosaic way than the eulogy for Thomas More, it summed up for me many aspects of Roger's personality, his appetite for life, his refusal to be affected by the Parkinson's disease that had been diagnosed back in 2011, his determination, his wish to be engaged his willingness to give and to be wholly part of the community. There goes Roger, I thought to myself. Well, we've heard this afternoon about his huge contribution in the fields of sport, medicine, academia and management. 
He was, of course, much garlanded because of all of this. Successively recognised by Her Majesty the Queen with a CBE in 1955, a knighthood in 1975, and by being made a Companion of Honour in 2017. Further by Her Majesty's Government in the minting, no less, of a commemorative 50p coin on the 50th anniversary of his four-minute mile. Roger's status and impact on the nation would have been reflected here today in the person of Her Royal Highness the Princess Alexandra, were it not for a family celebration of the, 17th birth, of the 70th birthday today of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. And he's been further honoured here in Oxfordshire, of course, by being made an honorary freeman of the city, by an honorary degree from Oxford Brookes University, and by honorary fellowships of Exeter, Merton, Pembroke, and Harris Manchester Colleges, as well, one may throw into the pot, as, a as of a further 15 other universities on both sides of the Atlantic. He held numerous trusteeships of not-for-profit bodies up and down the country, of Cumberland Lodge for 20 years, of Leeds Castle and Atlantic College, governorships of Abingdon and Sherburne schools. As Bill Deeds once said of him, he was unable to refuse any task or chore in the realm of human affairs. So grand indeed, but without grandeur. We were tempted, all of us, I think, to put Roger on a pedestal. But he would never stand on that pedestal. For Roger was always courteous, curious, committed, lovable, sociable, and energetic. Many here will remember the pleasure of his company and his contagious enthusiasms. In his retirement, he began a rather formidable book club in Oxford named after St. Frideswide, the patron saint of the city. Often, I may say, a challenge for its more challenged members as we attacked fat political biographies, the Anglo-Saxon history of France, Herodotus, and Pseudodoxia Epidemica. <laughs> However much some of the lesser spirits might have floundered, Roger's curiosity and perceptiveness was always undimmed and whatever the book we were challenged by. In another sphere, he founded a walking group which happily trudged the footpaths around Oxford. And he had the temerity to enter Moira's territory by doing both a wood carving course and a creative writing course, the latter reading to his very readable autobiography already mentioned, Twin Tracks. He and Moira, both incredibly generous and legendary party givers, had tea parties where Roger's obvious delight was to provoke discussion on difficult topics. At the centre of any party, there would be Roger. Not telling his own stories, rather encouraging others to tell theirs. Probing, listening, celebrating. In particular, he'd give time to young people because always curious about what next and subsequent generations were doing and thinking. And his fleet of 14 grandchildren Eight of them here today can testify to that. A personal example is the time he gave to my nephew who'd spent two and a half years cycling round the world. Roger was genuinely and enthusiastically thrilled to hear about his adventures. Until latterly, he'd always make time when he could to speak at events, to present prizes, to continue exploring what was going on in all aspects of life in the county and the city. He had the most extraordinary capacity for those who had the privilege of seeing him relatively often, of searchingly cross-examining them on what they were up to, how things were going, disconcertingly remembering the detail of a conversation that might have taken place three or six or even 12 months previously, wanting to be updated 
on stories and events. Many of the guests here today will recognize this and may indeed have found themselves, as I often did, preparing in advance for the fascinated <laughs> questioning that would follow when Roger's gaze should fall on them. <laughs> today we celebrate Roger's life and the huge contribution he's made in so many fields. A man for all seasons indeed. Wit and learning, gentleness, lowliness and affability, of marvellous mirth and pastimes, of many talents, of many interests combined with that rare skill of reaching out to share those talents and interests with others. For his appetite for life was indeed unparalleled, without sense of his own grandeur, walking with kings, nor losing the common touch. And so he entered into our lives into the lives of family and friends, into community life in Oxfordshire, and into the collective life of the nation. An enduring role model for us all. Lady Bannister, Lord Lieutenant, ladies and gentlemen. The attributes praised by the Romans, which were incorporated in their word virtus, were essentially, hence of course the derivation of the word, rather narrowly associated with manliness. In time, this developed from its original heavy emphasis on martial courage, Huertus began to incorporate prudence, justice, and self-control, even all-round excellence. It became, in other words, ever closer to the word used by the Greeks to praise the highest virtue, arete. And that, it seems to me, is the best description of the qualities and life of the man we remember today. Roger Bannister's was a life exceedingly well lived. And the reason why we are always most likely to remember him was in his judgment, only a fragment of the whole story. Of course, for someone of my generation, no millennial here, that blustery day in May 1954, when on the ash track at Ifley Road. He became the first man to run a mile in less than four minutes. Is one of the landmarks in one's life. For my part, it's made especially memorable by the very ordinariness of the events that surrounded this extraordinary achievement. The Saturday morning that began with the young doctor's ward rounds at St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington, the spiked running shoes thrown into the sports bag, the train ride from Paddington to Oxford, the pub lunch with friends, the wait with his pacemaking colleagues, Chris Chataway and Chris Brasher, for the wind to drop, the return on to Harrow on the Hill that evening after that extraordinary triumph for a celebratory drink. Then came the understanding, no need to express it, shared with his fellow Corinthians as they looked down from that suburban hill at the lights of London below them, that now they had the world at their feet, figuratively and I suppose Literally, Chassaway and Brasher had set out with Roger Bannister to do the hitherto impossible. Roger had set his heart, his legs, and his lungs on this heroic feat. In Homer's language, what he greatly thought 
he nobly dared. Having dared and having won, Roger, like Chataway and Brasher, dared some more, not resting on laurels, but going on to live up to their full potential in other walks of life. The world had been at his and at their feet, and they chose to journey on and push back the bounds that they were able to extend well beyond the running track. Arete. Plato wrote that athletic training was an important part of the education of a young man. But it should not, he believed, consume the whole of a life. The achievement of excellence in any and every field was the real challenge. That was something that Roger Bannister understood expressing it in the language of a practical scientist. A basic aspect of human personality, he said, was the need to test ourselves. That's why, evolutionally, the chimpanzee never had a chance. <laughs> the mile record broken, then Australian champion John Landy defeated in one of the greatest races there has ever been. Bannister retired from athletics, literally at the top. He set out, as his proud parents would have wanted, to be a fine scientist and doctor, and a public servant of the greatest distinction. At the, all the time, all the time he displayed the generosity and grace of a truly chivalrous man. Many of us, as the Lord Lieutenant mentioned, can tell the same sort of stories about him. Learning, for example, that my wife's father, a Cambridge hurdler who competed in the Berlin Olympics and was killed near Falaise in the Normandy campaign, Roger searched all through his books on athletics to find every reference he could to John Thornton so that he could give them to my wife. In one of uh, his letters to the Philippians, St. Paul described that notion of arete as meaning whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is gracious. Quite so. I've always thought that the most enduring heroes are marked by simplicity. They don't seek acclaim. They don't bluster. They don't flounce. Their charisma shines all the brighter, partly because of their modesty and their charm. One of my last recollections of Roger Bannister is seeing him being pushed in his chair through a crowd of young blues at a summer party in the parks, being pushed by a youthful Olympic medalist. He glowed with enthusiasm in the company of these young women and young men, preparing, he would have hoped, and would have expected, preparing, for them to, preparing to take all that life had to offer them all its challenges, and to show for their part why the chimpanzee had not won and would never win. He would rightly have expected them to give back as much as or more than life had given them. Like King Demetrius in Petrarch, he no longer had the need of his purple robes. When the play was over, he slipped out in simple clothes and went away down the street. His running shoes, his stethoscope, his white gown, his medals, his companionship of honour, all put away. There's another Greek who comes to mind. He lived a long way from Harrow, 
a long way from Ifley Road. Le the learned King Antiochus, whose life the Alexandrian poet C.P. Cavafy tells us had been restrained and gentle. On his death, an Ephesian sophist wrote an epitaph to send to his grieving sister. The Ephesian wrote, he was just, wise, courageous. In addition, he was that best of things. He was Hellenic. Mankind has no quality more precious. Everything beyond that belongs to the gods. Hellenic from Harrow. Hellenic from the Ifley Road. From Pembroke and Oxford. I return finally to the very beginning of this comparison with the virtues of the classical world, back to Homer. There is, he wrote, a time for many words, and there's also a time for sleep. A time for sleep for Roger Bannister, a hero for this age, a hero and an inspiration for any and every age, a good, an honourable man, who lived a good and honourable life. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. My family's heartfelt thanks to the city, the university, and all the speakers. I want to tell you of Roger's courage, which several speakers have already mentioned. As a 13-year-old boy, small, he bravely cycled alone from a bombed bath to a bombed London just to visit friends. Picture him also as a 23-year-old stepping off a plane in London after the Helsinki Olympics to a hurricane of press censure for not winning a medal. As you know, two years later, with Brayshaw and Chatterway's help, he confounded them all. In 1955, Brescia and another friend persuaded him to tackle one of Switzerland's highest peaks, despite his lack of skiing and climbing experience. <laughs> Halfway up, Chris told him, if you fall down a crevasse, stick out your elbows. <laughs> that may save your life. <laughs> Later still, in his 25-foot yacht, in a storm, he just escaped a lee shore at Portland Bill. Our three children, still young, were the only crew. Sometimes he could be courageous almost to the point of recklessness. <laughs> Even when at his most exasperating, you couldn't help but love him. <laughs> he fought staunchly to keep the Sports Council independent, make international competition drug-free, as you've heard, and allow British athletes to attend the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. And it was very much against uh, Americans and other people's wishes. After our terrible car crash in 1975, he faced gallantly no longer being able to run, which he did for pleasure with the children almost every evening he could. 
and he stepped onto the hardly traced path of research into the autonomic nervous system. He approached every facet of life with gusto, although his daily existence often seemed one of very hard work, we also had enormous fun. We danced at John Kennedy's inaugural ball. We've danced at Buckingham Palace. We were invited to thrilling places all over the world, meeting thousands of individuals who shared his passion for sport and medicine, many telling him and later writing to him that his example had transformed their lives. At our cottage near the South Downs, he would orchestrate a bank holiday orienteer, sometimes naming a tree by the wrong name. That wasn't his forty. Um, <laughs> he uh, invited all the competing families back to tea, gave an amusing speech, and finally awarded the winner with the challenge of setting up the next orienteer. <laughs> His excitement about the lives of our four children and 14 grandchildren never wavered. He cared deeply for their health, progress, and happiness. One way or another, he imparted to them his love of life and the values he held. Grasp the gift of life. Find out what you're good at. Give it your all. Love and care for your family and friends. Enjoy their company. This is the course he took. My own happiness and fulfillment have lain in sharing that course with him. You can imagine our joy in this February when we held for the first time, Aurora, Dawn, our first great-grandchild. I will end with a verse. Lives of great men all remind us that we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing all life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing may take heart again. On which happy note, let's all depart for the civic at the town hall. <laughs>